Uh, well, good morning, good morning, Rolling Hills Church family. It's so good to be together today. Welcome to everybody here at our Franklin campus. Welcome to our online campus. So thankful we can worship our great God together. And happy Mother's Day. Wow, to all the moms here, you all look great. And what a special day, what a wonderful day. And I hope and pray you feel loved, that you feel celebrated today because you are. You make such a difference in the lives of all of us. And man, we all have a mom, so I hope you... Text your mom, call your mom today, you know, and just reach out to her and just tell her thank you because moms are incredible. We are so grateful for all of you. And also, welcome back. We're in this great series. We're in this series called Masterclass. And in this series, we're studying the book of Romans, which is unbelievable. It is so good. It's so deep. It's so rich. And then we are digging in to God's Word. And Romans was a letter written by the Apostle Paul around 57, 58 A.D., right? He's writing from Corinth to the church in Rome. And the church in Rome was flourishing. It was growing. People were coming to know Christ. It was great. Uh, but it was also hard, right? Because Rome was the epicenter of the world at this time. Uh, Rome, right? The whole Roman Empire. Rome had conquered almost all of the world at this time. And so Rome, about two to four million people around this time. And, and there in Rome was kind of the center of everything. It was the political hub. The Caesars all lived there in their palaces, the wealth, the opulence, the Roman Senate, right? You had the Colosseum, the Circus Maximus, you know, Roman baths. You had all this incredible architecture and this abundance of wealth. Uh, they also had a lot of slaves there in Rome. So it was a godless place. I mean, it was a place where, man, you had a lot of wealth, but you also had a lot of craziness going on, okay? Let's just be honest. There was a lot of total depravity. You had Roman orgies that were happening, the Roman baths, the things they did with kids and with women. It was not a great place, right? But it was the place that was the center of the world at the time. And so the Apostle Paul is writing to the church there. Paul had never been there. And he's writing this letter to encourage the church. And he's saying, I want to come because Paul knew, like, if we can impact Rome, the gospel is going to go all over the world, right? If we can impact Rome for Christ, the gospel is going to go out. And Paul eventually comes there. We know at the end of Acts, uh, but he comes as a prisoner, but still God uses him in a powerful way to impact many in Caesar's household. And so God was doing something big there. And so Romans is just an incredible book. You know, as you look at history, right, if you want to understand the Bible, you, you go to Romans. All the great theologians have studied Romans and the impact. And so we're digging in there. Every great revival has come out of the book of Romans. And so for us, if we want to have a revival in our own hearts and lives, in our own community, in our own country, we, we dive into God's Word and we say, God, what do you want to teach us? Now, we've been in Romans 1 through 3. And in Romans 1 through 3, it's kind of the first section of Romans. There's four different sections. And the first section is the bad news, right? The first section is 1 through 3 is the bad news. It's like Romans 1, it's like the sins of the Gentiles. And the Gentiles are people who aren't Jewish, okay? And so he's talking about the sins of Rome and all the bad things that were happening there. And you read through Romans 1, you're like, Wow, it sounds a lot like today. You know, it's just like all these sins. But then he goes to Romans 2 and he says, the sins of the Jews. And he's like, all the people who are self-righteous and you trust in your own righteousness and you think you're good enough. No, you're not. And then last week we saw Romans 3. In Romans 3, he says this, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Apostle Paul, man, he brings all of humanity into a courtroom to stand before God. And you hear God say, guilty, holy God, Sinful man, right? Guilty. But then we saw the good news. Last week in Romans 3, verse 21, it all begins to shift. And that begins the second section of Romans. It is the grace of God. And so verse 21 there in Romans 3, man, it is so powerful. Like, I mean, it is called the most beautiful literature, right, ever written. It is awesome. Right there, it gives the whole gospel. And it says, yes, we were guilty. Yes, we should be condemned. But Jesus, when that gavel came down and said guilty, Jesus stepped out and said, no, I'll take your place. I'll pay the price. You are forgiven. Isn't that the good news? Right? That is the good news. And then we come today to Romans chapter 4 as God continues this great message for us today. So if you have a Bible with you, I invite you to open with me to Romans chapter 4. Romans Chapter 4, New Testament, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, all about Jesus, then Acts, the early church, and then Romans, these Pauline epistles, these letters to the churches. So Romans chapter 4, and here's what Paul does. He calls two witnesses. He says, it's not by works. It's not you can't save yourself, 
right? And I'm going to give you two witnesses from the Old Testament. And so he calls Abraham and David and says, look, it's not by works, it's by faith. So pick up here, Romans chapter 4, verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? So for the Jewish people, Abraham is like, whoa. I mean, like he is the great one, right? I mean, like Abraham, he didn't do anything wrong. Like he's Abraham, the forefather. He says, well, what did he discover? Is it about works? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. Now, Abraham was an incredible guy, okay? I mean, he was generous. He was hospitable. I mean, the guy was just unbelievable. He was always having people over, always taking care of people's needs. He was tithing before tithing was in vogue. I mean, like he was like in a 10%. Like he's just like taking care of everybody. He was so generous. And people loved Abraham. People still love Abraham, right? But it wasn't about works. He's like, the standard's perfection. Remember that in Romans 1, 2, and 3? The standard's perfection. And he failed, right? He didn't measure up. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. It wasn't about works. It was about faith. It was about trusting God. Look, even with Abraham. Now, to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. So you go to your work, you do your job for two weeks, you don't get your paycheck and go, oh, thank you, that was so generous. You go, like, I earned that, right? I worked really hard. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. But if somebody gives you a paycheck and you didn't do any work, then you go, thank you, <laughs> right? And that's what he's saying. He's like, Jesus stepped in and paid your price. You didn't do anything. It's not about what you do. It's about what he's done. And then he calls another guy, David. And David in the Old Testament, his Old Testament king, he was known as a man after God's heart. He wasn't perfect either. But David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Now, I don't know if you underline your Bible, but wow, you ought to underline that. Or star it or circle it or something. Because how awesome is that? Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. You think about your sins. You think about the things we've done. Satan reminds us all the time, right? And you just go, get behind me, Satan. I am forgiven by the grace of God. Look at what God has done for me. Skip down to verse 16. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. Right? The faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our Father in the sight of God in whom He believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham and hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it has been said to him, so shall your offspring be. So Abraham was this guy, right, that God called him. And God says, I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the stars of the sky. And Abraham waited and waited and waited and waited for a child. And finally, finally in his old age, he has a child. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. Since he was about 100 years old. Okay, that's pretty old. Okay, that's like really old. Right? And his wife Sarah's womb was also dead. She was 90. Yet, he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. But was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. Again, I don't know if you underline your Bible, but man, what a great verse. Being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. And last week we looked at that word justification and we said that word means this, just as if I never 
sinned. So back in the Old Testament, Abraham, David, they had faith that God would save them, that God would take care of them, and they followed God, right? Back in the Old Testament, you're looking forward to the Messiah. Now we look back in the New Testament to the Messiah, but it all comes down to Jesus. It all comes down to what God did for us, and it's a journey of faith. And that's what God wants us to get today, to follow him and to trust him all the days of our lives. Wow. Okay, if you're taking notes today, here's some things I'd love for you to write down. I'd love for you to get this. If you have notes, if you have your master class journal, if you don't have one of these, just encourage you because we're diving deep this whole time in God's Word. Also, maybe you're online, you want to go to the Rolling Hills app, there's a place to fill in some blanks. But see this today from Romans chapter 4. Check this out. The goal of master class is to be informational and inspirational. All right, and so we're diving in. You're going to get some terms in Romans that's going to help you understand the entire Bible. In these terms, you're like, oh, okay, this begins to make sense now, right? But it's also inspirational because it's not the Apostle Paul who's writing Romans. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy, all Scripture is God-breathed, God-breathed, and useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So that you and I are equipped. That's why we're digging in to God's Word. So here's a couple of terms, right? The Gentiles are non-religious and uncircumcised, okay? While the Jews are religious and circumcised. So when you're reading and you see Jews, Gentiles, Jews, right? You've got all the Jewish people, the people that God carved out for himself. Gentiles is all of us, basically, right? It's everybody else. It was the Romans. It was everybody else. But here he's talking to the Gentiles and to the Jews. Circumcision, which you can read a lot there, circumcision was given as a sign of the first covenant. Okay? So Abraham was 99 when he was circumcised. Wow. Okay, <laughs> you know. But circumcision, when you think about it, it was for males only, right? I mean, males only. Now we circumcise our babies today. There's health reasons. You can go back and look. But God said this is going to be the sign of the Jewish people. And you think about that. It was a patriarchal system, right? It, it, was, it was for men. Jesus did more for women's rights than any person in history. Jesus did more to invite women into the greater story. And that's what you begin to see. There was the first covenant, but now it says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Jesus changes it all. So now baptism becomes the sign of the second covenant. And that's beautiful. Because baptism is for all. I mean, what a beautiful baptism today. I mean, just seeing that, right? It's for men, it's for women, it's for children. That we make that commitment. Baptism is an outward sign of what God's already done in our hearts and our lives. When you make that step forward and say, I'm going to live by faith, that God is my God. I receive the grace of Christ, that Jesus pays the price for my sins. That's what this verse tells us from Colossians. In him, Jesus, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Praise the Lord for that, right? Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So baptism, you're dying your old way of life, being raised to walk a new life. And that's what God's doing. That's the invitation for all of us. It's a life of faith, of trust. So Abraham is an example for us. That's why Paul calls him in and says, hey guys, check it out. Check out Abraham all the way back there. It wasn't about works. It wasn't like he did enough good things and he earned his way to God. He had faith that God could handle it. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Look, God made a promise to Abraham that his life would impact generations. If you go back to Genesis chapter 11 and 12. So we're going back there, right? Kind of toward the beginning of the Bible. God called this guy, his name was Abram at the time. He's living in the Ur of the Chaldeans. His dad made idols, right? 
Back then, they were polytheistic. They worshiped many gods, many idols. But God called him, and he says in Genesis chapter 12, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Physically, yes, but also spiritually. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse and all the people of the earth will be blessed through you. What an incredible promise, right? And so Abram does. He goes to what's now the Holy Land, right? He goes to the promised land there. And he leaves the polytheism and he says, I'm going to be monotheistic. I'm going to say there's one God and I'm going to trust him. And I'm going to follow him all the days of my life. And God goes, hey, you're going to impact generations. You're going to impact generations. And Abraham does. Abraham became the father of three major world religions, okay? Judaism, right? They trace back to Abraham. Also, Christianity, right? Maybe you grew up and you went to VBS and you did Father Abraham. I mean, he sounds, you remember that song, right? They had all your body parts going like, right? You know, that's like, I am one of them and so are you, right? And so you kind of come all the way back there. So you have the Jews back there. You got Christians coming back to Abraham too. But did you know also... Islam. Islam comes back to Abraham. Why? Because there was a point in Abraham's life that he stopped trusting God. There was a point in Abraham's life when he says, you know what, God, I'm tired of waiting you. I'm going to do it my way. And him and his wife, Sarah, agreed, and she had a maidservant named Hagar. And so Hagar sleeps with Abraham and becomes pregnant, has a child, Ishmael. And God says, that's not the promise. Keep waiting. Keep waiting. Well, now, right, Islam traces back all the way through Ishmael. So when you see Christians and Jews coming together, and you think one day you'll hopefully go to Israel, and you can see where the Temple Mount was built over the place where Abraham and Isaac were together, and now there stands the Dome of the Rock where Islam would say that was Abraham and Ishmael. And you can still see even the vision today and the consequences of not trusting God even today. But... Abraham comes back to God. Abraham followed God by faith even before the law was given. So Abraham comes back and says, God, I should have done that. I want to repent of that, you know. And God, I'm going to wait and I'm going to trust you. And then the child Isaac's born when Abraham's 100 and Sarah is 90. But here's what he's saying. Even before the law, the law wasn't given until Exodus chapter 20. So you had Abraham all the way back there trusting God that God's got a plan for my life when everybody else was not. He was standing firm. See, God wants us to live by faith. God wants us to live by faith. And we live in a world of idols today. We live in a world where people run after, whether it's the idol of money, whether it's the idol of success, whether it's the idol of another person. Well, I'm going to run after those things. And there's polytheism even in our world today. And God's saying, I want you to live for me. I want you to trust me. Trust me with your life. Hold on to me. Live for me. Encourage people. Bless people. You can make a difference. And Abraham becomes that example for us. So look, therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. And for us to be faithful today, here's the thing. It's not about religion, but about a relationship with God. And we can get caught up in their religion. Right? I mean, caught up in what I do, and maybe I can earn it in my good works and my things until we come to the fact and go, God, I need you. And I want to walk with you. And then we want to do those things out of a love relationship with God. Then we want to encourage others and bless others and be generous and hospitable and take care of people because of what God's done for us. Not to earn our way to heaven, but because of what we've received. Faith is about trusting God. It's about trusting God. God, this is my life, and I give it to you. (laughs) And God, you can do more through my life than I can even imagine. And so, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to follow you. God, I'm going to love you with an everlasting love. And maybe nobody else around me does, but God, I will. I will stand up for you. Abraham remained faithful to God all of his life. He messed up. He wasn't perfect. He made mistakes. We've all made mistakes. And I love that in the Bible is real about the things that people do because Abraham, David, all those guys, they they messed up. But man, they turned around and they 
repented and they came back to God and they stayed faithful to God. And God did things in their life that were incredible. It doesn't mean everything was perfect in their life. It doesn't mean everything was easy in their life because it's not. There's things that are hard that we go through in our lives. But will we stay faithful to God? Will we trust God today? You know, today is Mother's Day, and uh, I'm so thankful. My mom uh, goes to our church, and she's awesome. She's here every week. I'm so grateful and so thankful for her. And my wife, Lisa, is an incredible mom. I just love her so much. Um, but I also know Mother's Day can be a hard day. Uh, for my wife, Lisa, she misses her mom. And every year on Mother's Day, it's, it's always hard, you know, because we've got our kids, and she's so excited. But she also misses her mom. Her mom went home to be with the Lord you know, like 14 years ago, and she still misses her. Um, for some, Mother's Day is really hard because you miss your mom, or maybe you don't have as great a relationship with your mom. Um, it's also hard for a lot of people because maybe they want to be a mom, or they're not, or things haven't gone like they thought maybe in their life, and yet will we stay faithful, and yet will we hold on. I want you to hear today from two amazing people, two of my Great friends, but they're also two of the wisest people I know. So Amy Alexander, who is the executive director of the Refuge Center right here in our own community. She's her and Dan are part of our church, and I'm just so thankful for them. And then Kathy Kuhn, who is our staff counselor, and she is amazing. Her and Scott are awesome. And, and so happy Mother's Day to both of y'all. Thank You're both moms, and uh, we are so grateful for you. Um, hey, Amy, tell us how do we deal with Mother's Day when it's hard? Well, I'm so grateful that our church is taking the opportunity to really paint the fuller picture this morning. Mm. You know, it's important that we realize that for some people this day is. It's celebration, honoring, gratitude. And for others, this day highlights a loss. And it's representative of the absence of a mother or a child. And for those who are grieving, we want you to know that if you're here this morning, we see you. You mm. are not invisible. And your grief is as unique as your fingerprint. So the things that you're going to need on a day like today are unique to you and your story. And we just want to give you permission to do what you need to do. So it might be that you need to skip the family brunch today, and that would be okay. It may be that you need to visit a graveside, that you need to call someone, spend some time walking, praying, reading, journaling. But you are giving yourself permission to tend to your grief. There's no one right way to do today. Mm, thank you. Kathy, how do we have hope and restoration in the middle of things that are hard sometimes? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it seems like our circumstances or our situation are hopeless. We're not mm. where we thought we would be. Our life doesn't look the way that it should. But if you think about what hope means, it's the expectation of what's to come. It's a faith in God's promises that one day all things will be restored and there will be no more mourning, no more difficulty in relationships, no more grief. But right now, while we're living in this life, right, we experience trials and we experience suffering. And that's when we have to be reminded of what God's truth are, what God's truth is and what his promises are, that he will never leave or forsake Amen. us, that he knows every single thing that's going on in our heart and our minds and, and in our lives. And he's the perfect parent, right? He's the perfect father who is here right now to comfort us and to bring us the strength and the peace that we need to be able to walk out whatever it is that we are navigating. Mm. Wow. That's powerful, mm. right? You know? Uh, Amy, talk about this. How do we move forward mm -hmm. in times of grief? Mm -hmm. How do we move forward? Because we're all going to go through loss, mm -hmm. right, in, in our lives and um, later on or different stages, or maybe we're in that right now. But, but how do we move forward in that and not stay in that? Yeah. Well, most of you are familiar with the six stages or stations of grief, maybe the first five. A sixth one has been added recently. But we call them stations because they're not linear. We move back and forth and in and out of them. But it's denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And reaching acceptance doesn't mean things are okay. It doesn't mean it's the way you want it to be. Acceptance means we will face reality and move forward, not on, but forward, with more love than pain, with more love than pain. And so a few ways to do that, as you think about honoring your loved one and finding meaning in the legacy maybe that they've left behind, 
There's a term called continuing bonds, and that, may, that means looking for ways to stay connected to them. So maybe it's that each morning you drink out of your mom's coffee mug, or you wear a piece of her jewelry, or if you and your nine-year-old son always sat on the second stair of the porch and looked up at the stars, that you're gonna keep doing that in his honor. It might mean uh, joining a 5K mm -hmm. or a charity that your loved one was involved in, and that's a way to keep their legacy alive. And finally, it could be thinking about your favorite attribute about them. So maybe you had a teenage daughter and she was the kindest person you had known. And now in her honor, you will show an act of kindness to a stranger every day. And that's keeping her spirit alive. Wow. Um, Kathy, how, do, how does God use others to kind of help grow our own story or to minister to us in those times? Yeah, um, in so many incredible ways. I think about the, maybe the, the woman who's sitting in here today and she's celebrating, right? <laughs> Today's a great day. I'm super excited about today. And that's such a beautiful thing and we should celebrate that. But also to have eyes and a heart that sees that the people who might not be experiencing the same thing that we are today and, and to remember and to acknowledge that. And we have the opportunity to pray for other people. There's really nothing more powerful that we can do to, but to lock arms mm. and to pray for them. And also asking, ask people, what is today like for you? Not assuming that we know how they're feeling, not assuming, not assuming that we know what they want us to do or the best day to walk along, the best way to walk alongside them, but ask them, what do you need today and how can I love you best? And then on the other side of it, I mean, look in, look in this room, <laughs> look at how many incredible women, women that there are in mm -hmm. this space. And online, how many women there are, godly women, and God uses other people in our lives to provide for us. And it may not replace that difficult relationship that we have maybe with our mother or that loss that we've experienced, but God uses people in our lives to teach us, to encourage us, to walk alongside us, hold our arms up when we feel like we can't anymore. And there's just so much to learn within the body of Christ, and there's so much healing that can happen within that community. Wow, so good. Amy, what encouragement would you give us today uh, on this Mother's Day? What, what would you say to us? Yeah, so hope sometimes is a felt sense in your body that I'm not by myself in this. It's, it's that sense of relief. Mm -hmm. So I wanna give you a couple really practical things today that can bring hope in your life. The first one, Mr. Rogers always said, if it's mentionable, it's manageable. And that just means if we can talk about it, if we can say it out loud, we will find our way through it. So in that, you've got to be able to articulate your needs. And you know what? That stinks. If you are the person grieving and now it's also your responsibility to tell people what you need, that is hard. But people don't know what you need and it's going to get messy. So if you can articulate these three things, I feel, I want, I need. I feel, I want, I need. I'm feeling sad today. I want somebody to know that I'm really not okay and I need to call my friend Sarah and walk with her and mm. maybe cry it out. So finish those three sentences. And then the last thing is I want to introduce you to the idea of this grief river. So if you can imagine your life as an acre of land. So when you experience a traumatic loss, it's as though there's a river that has now come onto your property. And you didn't want it there, but it is there to stay. You, you can't ignore it, but it's not going anywhere. And some days the river will be bright and sparkling and the water's moving and it feels okay. And other days it's a murky, muddy trickle and it feels bad. With grief, we need it to move. We need it to be adaptive. But what happens is these sticks and logs fall in the river and these things, they dam up the flow so it can't move. And typically those sticks and logs those are the way it ended. So it's the last look. It's the fact that I never got to say some things that were always on my heart, or I said terrible things and I didn't get to make it right. And those kinds of regrets, they impede on our ability to move forward. We won't forgive ourselves or we can't access positive memories. So hope sometimes come in, comes in the form of talking to a professional who can help pull those sticks and logs out of the river so your grief can flow again. Wow, that's powerful. And thank you for what you do. I mean, yeah. with the Refuge Center, I mean, we have lots of people here who come and uh, you minister to so many 
in our church and in our community, and I'm just so grateful. And Kathy, thank you for your ministry here, and I mean, people come and see you all the time, and, and what a difference you guys make individually and in marriages and in families, and we are so grateful for you, and happy Mother's Day to you both. Thank We're you. just so grateful for the difference you make. Let's give them a hand. Uh, thank you. Wow, that was wise. That was really wise, and I hope you'll take that with you and keep that with you. All right, look at these others. First of all, our faith is not in Abraham, but in Jesus. And I think this is so important. The Jews got caught up in this. They got caught up in the law, and they got caught up in people, and began to kind of worship people and put people on a pedestal. And we can do that too. And we have to be really careful, like in our lives, man, are we worshiping somebody else? Or are we worshiping Jesus and keeping Jesus on the forefront? The words that was credited to him were not written for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Hey, we are dead in our sins, but by God's grace and through Jesus, we receive life. Guys, we've all been declared guilty. We all made mistakes. We all know it, right? We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But by Jesus, we have life. Life eternal. And for us to hold on to Jesus, for us to hold on to that fact through the good times and the hard times. That God hasn't given up on me. That God hasn't left me. That God is with me. That God is for me. And so live in that truth. Look, trust Jesus with your life in salvation and in the everyday. Right? Sometimes we give our lives to Christ. You know, maybe you were eight years old and you committed your life to Christ and you were baptized. And then we immediately kind of go to the way of the world. We're like, well, okay, I'll, I'll be in heaven one day, but I'm going to live like the world today. And it's not just in salvation. It's for us every day. For us to live for him and for his glory. Knowing we're going to make mistakes, right? But when we do, we get right back up. When we do, we go forward. When we do, we don't get stuck. We go forward in Christ and in Christ alone. And for us to find our worth in Jesus, for us to find our hope in Jesus, for us to find our life in Jesus, and for us to grow every day in Jesus. Hey, trust God. Trust God has a plan for our lives and for our family. Trust God. You know, and and sometimes we can get like Abraham, we want to take matters in our own hands, or we can get off track like David and David and these sins that he committed. But man, when we just trust God, God's going to fulfill his plan for my life. God has a great plan for me. And I'm going to trust him with that. I'm going to trust him with that. Look, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. I love that. Being fully persuaded. Do you have that persuasion in your life? Are you fully persuaded that God has the power to do what he's promised? That God has the power to take care of you? That God has the power to take care of your family? See, God's not finished with any of us yet. He's not. There's still breath in our lungs for a reason. Abraham was 100 years old. Sarah was 90 years old, right? But God had a plan. And for us, I don't know how long life takes, but man, whatever days we have on this earth, that we'd be faithful. Whatever days we have on this earth, that we would know that God is at work in us and through us for his glory. Miracles can still happen in our life. Miracles aren't just like in the Old Testament. Miracles aren't just in the Bible. Miracles are today. That when you put your faith and trust in God, when you live your life for the glory of God, when you're praying for God to move in a mighty way, miracles still happen. Miracles still happen. So may we stay faithful to God all the days of our life and impact generations. May we stay faithful to God and impact generations. You think about Abraham, right? Impacted generations. But you are too. You are too. And you think about all the moms here. You think about dads that are here. You think about grandparents that are here. And you you think about impacting your family, but you're impacting generations. You think about being a part of this church. You're impacting generations. And for us to be faithful to God, to not get distracted with the things of this world, to hold tight to Him. Listen, church, your obedience matters. Your obedience to God matters. It matters not only to you, it matters not only to your family, it matters to the next generation, to the people who come behind us. So will we live our lives for the glory of God? Will we not get distracted with the things of this world, the idols of this world? Will we focus on Him? I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes just for a moment. I don't know where you are today. 
Maybe today is the day of salvation. You go, Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life. I know I've sinned. I know I've messed up. But Jesus, come into my heart. I want to live by faith. Forgive my sins. Maybe God's speaking to you today about baptism. (laughs) That outward sign of that covenant relationship with God. Maybe you saw the baptism this morning. It was like, yes. Oh, I want that in my life. I want that in my family. I want to make a statement. I want to put a stake in the ground that I'm living for God. Maybe today, God's just saying, be faithful. (laughs) I'm with you through the good times. I'm with you through the hard times. Stay faithful to me. I'm not finished with you. I'm not finished with your story. Maybe today you just go, thank you. (laughs) God, I have so much to be thankful for today. I'm thankful for salvation. I'm thankful for your presence in my life, for your presence in my family. And God, I'm thankful for what you're doing right here. God, I'm thankful for your church. And so, Father God, here we are, your church today. You think about Abraham and David and the Jews and their time, and and yet now you're working through the church to share hope, to share life, to share faith. God, I pray you would find us faithful, that we would be obedient to you all days of our life, that we would understand that we've been blessed to be a blessing, to bless others to be generous and kind and hospitable. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move right now. God, that we would open our eyes to see what you're doing in our own hearts, in our own families, in your church, in our community, and in the next generation for your glory. Thank you, oh God. Thank you, oh God, for your blessing. And may we pass it on. In the name of Jesus, we pray and respond to you right now.